Okay. Good morning. Welcome. Tell me later. What's the topic so I don't forget? Weightlifting. Like I need to start doing more of it? I get it. We don't have to talk about that. Okay. Are y'all ready? Are y'all ready? Greg's going to turn the music down in just a second here. Um, we got people just so happy to see each other and smiling and talking, and I hate to interrupt that because that's certainly part of, you know, the joy of the Lord. Fellowshipping with other believers is a great privilege that we have in Christ. So it brings joy to my heart just to see you all smiling, talking to your neighbor there on the pew. And some of you are colder than others. Um, but, you know, I just look at it as finally an opportunity to wear socks. <laughs> so, you know, you got you to gotta find the silver lining in whatever you're facing, silver lining, I got that. Uh, Miss Eleanor is going to knit me a hat to uh, wear to keep my heat in, and maybe that'll be helpful. Well, let's see, announcements. Um, Steve and Craig and I were talking about how wonderful this time of year is when we have some winter residents from uh, other parts of the country. I'm looking at two, uh, three, four, five at least five of you. If you all want to hang out after the service today, uh, I will ask you a couple questions like, is there anything we can do to be ministering to you all during the winter months that you live down here? And part B, is there anything you all can do to be ministering with us actively? Is there something you all want to plug into, some ministry that we're doing that, you, that God has gifted you, equipped you in that uh, would benefit the saints while you're down here? We want you all to be as involved as you want to be. Actually, we probably want you to be more involved than you want to be. Uh, <laughs> So if you, if you want to hang out for five minutes after the, after the service and give me your answer to those questions, uh, I would appreciate that. And if not, I realize I sprung that on you last minute. You can call me, text me, email me um, if that works. Hey, Scott, don't forget to give me my keys. You took those and you never gave them back to me. Uh, you can give them to Heather. Thanks. Um, Scott's my friend. He's visiting. Okay, where am I? Church? Thanks for the reminder. Let me bring, let's bring it back in here. Uh, I was doing announcements this week, uh, I think, is a normal schedule. Last week of January, normal schedule, yep. Um, the service today is, I'm going to say, not normal in the sense that Pastor Craig's not sitting on his stool with his guitar. Uh, somehow, somebody authorized him to be absent today. It wasn't me. Trust me. <laughs> I would never approve that. Um, one of the consequences is uh, we had to hire a new music minister. His name is Greg Dully. Um, he's back there on the computer and apparently his only music skill set is tapping into YouTube. Uh, so he's going to play three songs on YouTube today. That's where we're at. Uh, but we're going to make a joyful noise to the Lord through that medium. I'm not going to stand up here with my microphone on and lead you in that. I think that would detract. Uh, you know, we're supposed to do things that enhance corporate singing, so I'm going to leave it to some professionals on YouTube that God has gifted uh, in that area to do that. So, um, Greg, you can start to, oh, you got it called up, and so when I step down, he can hit play. When I step down, you can stand up, and we'll sing three songs in a row, and uh, you close your eyes if you have to, just imagine, um, you know, what we're trying to do is worship the Lord. And so sometimes we get hung up if, uh, you know, there's a guy up front and he looks funny or he says he's wearing socks but it doesn't look like it and you're trying to figure out if he's telling the truth or not and you get distracted. And so sometimes I find that it's easier to worship if you just close your eyes, think about the words that you're singing. And so be gracious with us today as we go through a different... Uh, means of singing and pray that uh, the technology would work and if for some reason it doesn't uh, work perfectly then just uh, still love the Lord be patient and we'll work through it and then after those three songs uh, I'll call Steve up for the offertory prayer so that's what is in store Greg music, music minister for the day y'all stand as uh, we sing together
Well, I don't know about you, but I was blessed by that singing this morning. <laughs> I could actually hear everybody singing. It was really, it was really nice. Well, good morning. Now um, is our time to worship through giving. And uh, you just reflect on, in the words that we sang this morning, just how great and powerful God we serve is, and just how gracious and loving and kind and generous he is to us. In Malachi, uh, bring the, the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, and there po thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that you, it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. What a kind and gracious and generous God we serve. Let's pray. Father, thank you. We just acknowledge you as the giver of all good and perfect gifts. Father, thank you for uh, just supporting us as individuals and this church. Lord, we just pray, uh, Father, that you would give us the resources to continue to minister to those in need in the upper keys. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for everything that you've given us, uh, and may we be faithful. We just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And there's a plate up here, and there's also one in the back. All right. Talk to me afterwards if uh, you have thoughts on music. How we we're, we're always, you know, the goal is to enhance the corporate singing, whatever we can do to help one another worship the Lord. I won't know what you think about it unless you tell me. I'm still working on reading your minds. Um, before I preach this morning. I've asked uh, Nicky Runk to come up and just share a couple minutes. He promises that he's not like me. He's not as long as long winded as I am. Um, but Nicky Runk and his family, Christy, Xander, and Ellie, have been coming to our church over the last five years uh, when they are home to the states on sabbatical. They're missionaries to Haiti. Um, they have a sending church in North Carolina, Southern Baptist Church, and they work through Global Outreach International. And so this is their last Sunday with us before they head out of town. And so I've asked Nikki just to come and briefly share the work that y'all are doing uh, down in Haiti with us this morning. Thanks, guys. Whenever you see us here in uh, the Keys, um, it's kind of like a respite time of we try to save up for a few years and to get a chance to come down here and enjoy so uh we kind of are in the sidelines and just trying to get our brains back to working well in things um just a quick little couple of minutes here you know i grew up i was i was dropped off on our doorstep when i was three years old and uh, parents went their ways to do their drugs and alcohol and things so i know that's a big part of the key's life and think, well, I was a kid that was dropped off and taken in, never changed my name. They never adopted me. They just cared for me and loved me. And and uh, that was great. Grew up on a farm, farming, um, and things. Just all I knew was hard work. Um, come on through when I was eight years old, accepted Christ, and uh, go on a little farther. And uh, things, I grew up in a Southern Baptist church, thought I couldn't be a missionary. And things, uh, you know, if you're not one of the, um, the missionaries chosen from those churches and things you feel like you can't be and uh, when I was 2000 we went to Mexico and the Lord changed my life forever realizing the Lord could use some redneck like me uh, that had given skills to build houses and things so we built a church in a, in a few days in Mexico and and uh, everybody was looking to me what how do we do this and things so 
Uh, there were 75 of us on that trip and, and things. So God showed me then that God could use me. So I'm sharing this with you so you'll understand that there's nothing special about me. Uh, I'm not some big pastor or any of these kind of things. I'm just a, I'm a maintenance mechanic uh, type guy in things, and God uses. So uh, we, a friend of mine's parents were in Haiti uh, for years, and I went down to help them in 2001 and got a chance to see what Haiti was about. Went back three months later for a couple of weeks and uh, went we're just went for travel to help out there sometimes for three months to a week every year and things in uh, 2010 the Lord called us to another ministry um, and things to well drill and do maintenance and uh, whatever it took to go forward there uh, when we were called to Haiti there was five families and two singles uh, now there is us and another family and that other family is fixing to leave so it's amazing how the Lord has uh, allowed people to leave, but yet there's not other missionaries coming and things. So my goal is, it's been for 10 years, 11 years we've been there, is to get itself um, reliant to where it doesn't have to have so many missionaries just to, to keep things going. So we've got 60 employees. Uh, my, one of my main things is to do maintenance and things. We've got a 66-acre compound. Most of you have heard about the earthquake in 2010 and things, 316,000 people were killed in that earthquake. They're buried about three miles from our house in one mass grave and things. Um, well, whenever that earthquake happened, 20 different organizations came to our property because we were the only function in the conference center in the, in the country at that time. So much had gone down. Some buildings went down around us, but our buildings didn't go down and things, so Samaritan's Purse and North Carolina Baptist Men, Trinity Broadcast Network, all these big names were at our compound and things because we had facility and we had generators and fuel storage. Had that infrastructure and stuff not been in place, all those organizations wouldn't have been able to reach the people that they reached over the years that that what disaster was going on. So I'd tell you that, that this, we're not a big organization. We do have some, some land there that's uh, in a wall, but because the one missionary family stayed there 35 years, the longevity of keeping the right people hired, not making the same mistakes over and over, we see a lot of mis missions make, was crucial. And things, because of that, we're able to reach so many more people by working with other ministries. That is one of our biggest focuses, is try to work with other ministries so you multiply what we can do. We're not competing against each other. You know how churches compete around, you know, you, you can't even do things with other Baptist churches a lot of times because you don't want to steal our people in this, in America. But we try to go out of our way to work together with other ministries. Other ministries are, um, are able to use our our place and things. But um, well drilling is one of my things that I like to do uh, when we have support to do that. Um, to go out into a village and drill well, um, that opens the door to share the gospel. Uh, we had taken an evangelism team with me to share a gospel in all the places around there um, while we're drilling the well. Um, we, that opens the door, and we try to plug the people that come to the Lord into the local churches in those villages so it's not just a convert, but it's somebody that can be followed up with and things. Um, we have two guys that just well repair every day. We've drilled over 400 wells, and with that, that gives us opportunity to evangelize, evangelize, Another neat thing, some of our employees came to ask us, will you show us how to, do, to evangelize? Will you teach us to evangelize? Could you ever ask for anything more special than that? So we've done that over years, gone through the Bible, and now our guys once a month, when it's safe or there's not something going on, they go out, we pay them for the day, and they go out and evangelize in different villages that I've um, drilled wells in so they can plug people in. But it's them doing it. That's our whole goal is train up people so they're making disciples and multiplying it and things, not us down there, you know, being the ones that need to be in the front. We need to be behind the scenes. These are the Haitians. These are the Haitians, yes, um, and things. And like I said, one last, our, people saw the 17 Mar Americans that were kidnapped um, and things in October. Um, I remember exactly where we were sitting at a restaurant there in and things, but that was our next door neighbors. Seventy, they they live seventy yards away from our our compound. So those were our friends that were kidnapped and things. They were kidnapped going into town, in a different area. But um, that's part of 
everyday life for us. You know, we get to come to church here, and we don't have to worry about anybody kidnapping us. Let me tell you what, that is a blessed thing. Because there's sometimes we don't go to church because I don't know if we can get there and back safely, and our church is only a mile away from our house. So it, there's a lot of pressure on, you know, making the right choices. My family doesn't leave the compound anymore except to do a very few things just because of the kidnapping. But God is good. Uh, he has pulled me out of some situations and things. Um, we've got a large conference center that holds two to 300 people for week-long conferences, day conferences, whatever. Uh, to be able to uh, organization to tr to host them, to be able to train up healthcare workers, pastors, youth leaders, uh, we provide a facility, and that's one of our huge thing. We are the uh, by far the largest conference centers in Haiti, and two other ones have gone out of business in the last two years. One bankrupt, and the other one uh, actually broke apart in an earthquake last summer. So, um, plenty of opportunities for the Lord to to work and to bless, but. Those are some of the things that God has us doing. If you're interested in hearing any more, uh, stay afterwards, Brian said, and, uh, and things to uh, talk to us. But, you know, prayer is one of the biggest things we need is prayer to stay safe and things. So that's what keeps the world revolving for us. When I get to town and get back and don't get kidnapped or robbed or, or shot, uh, I've had a lot of close calls, unfortunately. But it's like, oh, man, it feels good to drive back in our gates and just like, whew, Made it again. Yeah. You know, that's from prayer. Yeah. So right. thank y'all. Thank you, Nikki. Um, th I know you said you're not special. There are some special things about you, and, and some of the, that specialness is your family. Christy, uh, Xander, and Ellie, why, why don't y'all come up and join uh, Nikki here as I pray for y'all? Um, we have been praying um, to, to have more missionary uh, focus and input. And uh, we just realized, huh, we have this missionary family right under our noses for the last five years. So please accept this from the people of First Baptist Isle Morada to go wow. towards uh, the greatest need that, that you guys see fit for that. So let's just uh, pray with me as, as we send them off uh, back to Haiti one more faithful time uh, for year number 13. Father, we're thankful for your people who are willing to fulfill the great commission and to go to the ends of the earth and uh, in this case the runk family going back to haiti where you have called them obviously a very dangerous very hostile place but a place where there are people created in the image of god who need deliverance from yeah. the lord jesus christ and so we pray for them first and foremost for a hedge of protection that you would guard them with your holy angels that you would protect them from the spiritual forces of darkness and that you would grant them good success in their goings and their comings that you would give them a peace that surpasses all understanding that even in the midst of life threatening dangers you would not allow them to be anxious but rather yeah. you would carry them along in your peace that guards our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord and then we pray for all their efforts whether it be well digging or the discipling of their Haitian employees and their training to go out into their culture to share the gospel with their people God, that you would use all those things synergistically together to bring about fruit for your eternal kingdom, that people would be saved, uh, that the gangs would uh, decrease in their influence, that the leaders would come to faith in Christ, and that they would use their dynamic leadership to lead others uh, in the gospel to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So may you be glorified in the Runk family, and may your kingdom be extended in Haiti through their efforts and uh, Lord give us a uh, burden to continually lift them up in prayer as he testifies that that is the greatest resource that the people of God could give to them in addition to, uh, to finances uh, is certainly the prayer and we can all do that no matter when so we pray that you would lay them in a special place in our hearts so uh, that we would be faithful to lift them up in prayer we trust all these things to your name Jesus amen Thank y'all. All right. I'm looking for six and under who need to go out because my sermons are too long. Do we have any of those? No? No take? <laughs> I'm not going to mention any names, Nancy, that you just raised your hand. We're in Genesis chapter 26 this morning. Two verses, 34 and 35. Vocabulary word, 
Theobroma cacao. Theobroma cacao. Theo, you recognize Theos, God. Broma, you may not recognize food. Literally, the food of the gods, cocoa. Theobroma cacao, it's a 26-foot tall evergreen tree that produces uh, one-pound pods as its fruit, green as it's maturing, yellow when it's ripe. They weigh about a pound a piece. The harvesters go out and they cut the pods down gently, take them, split the pods open. It's full of seeds or beans, 20 to 60 beans per pod, and they lay them out to ferment. A lot of times they put them under banana leaves for about a week to ferment, and then they take the banana leaves off and set them out in the sun to dry, and then they bag them up and they send them to the chocolate manufacturer, Theobroma cacao, food of the gods. And the chocolate manufacturers get the beans and they roast them, and then they're able to crack the shell off of them and put it into a vat where they make chocolate liqueur and the heat separates the cocoa butter from the chocolate solids. The chocolate solids are called nibs. When you make dark chocolate, you have 50 to 90 percent chocolate solids, which makes it very bitter. The sermon title today is Bitter or Sweet. Dark chocolate, very bitter. Milk chocolate only has 10 to 50 percent of the chocolate nibs, and so it is much more sweet. So are you ready for a theological jump to hyperspace here? Esau is bitter, Jesus is sweet. And now I want to take the long route to get there, but I was tempted to start with, I think, a good indicator of how much people love Jesus is, whether they like milk chocolate or dark chocolate tend to be more of a sweet person in love with Jesus if you love milk and, and more bitter if you love dark chocolate. But I couldn't find any theological support for that. So I'm going to abandon that right away. Okay, uh, Let's start with review. Remember Noah back in Genesis chapter 9. He was wronged by his youngest son, Ham. There was an incident where Noah was uncovered in his nakedness. Ham didn't do the right thing and taking care of that. It was a disgraceful act. Noah was super upset about that. So Ham was Noah's youngest son. Noah, in return, Genesis 9.25, cursed Ham's youngest son, whose name was Canaan, okay, the youngest son of Ham, Canaan, received the curse. The land of Canaan became the home of God's enemies, right? We we have been reading through that, and it's consistent throughout the Old Testament. Canaan's second son was Heth, and in Genesis 10, 15, we read that his descendants are called Hittites. Hittites, subset of the Canaanites, enemies cursed by God. The wives Esau takes today in Genesis 26, 34 are Hittites, literally the cursed enemies of God. Remember how adamant Abraham was about Isaac's taking of a wife? In Genesis 24, 3, he made his servant swear by the Lord the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites. It was of utmost importance for Abraham concerning Isaac's wife. And now Isaac's son Esau is taking not just one Hittite, but two Hittite women as his wives, plural. Now we're not talking about a spouse from a different Protestant denomination who has some differences of theological opinion than you do on a secondary or tertiary issue. We're not even talking about taking a spouse who's a Roman Catholic, because after all, there are proven cases where there have been genuine, faithful Roman Catholics who have adhered to the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, one that has not been polluted or corrupted and thereby cursed, anathema, because it interjects and includes works in that presentation. So... We're not even talking about that kind of marriage. We're talking about 
making a lifelong commitment before God with a spouse who worships a false god, little g. That is unthinkable, untenable, unbiblical. But that is what Abraham's son, Isaac's son, Esau, has decided to do in our text this morning. Genesis chapter 26, verse 34. When Esau was 40 years old, he took Judith, the daughter of Beri, the Hittite, to be his wife, and Basemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. Father God, as we consider the truth of your word this morning, we pray that you would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear. Help us to understand your word, that we might be changed to be more like Jesus for the saints in the room. And for those who are outside of Christ, we pray that this contrast between bitterness and sweetness would open their eyes to see the truth of the glorious gospel in Jesus Christ, that they would come to salvation to embrace your word and your way. In Jesus' name, amen. My first point this morning is the root of bitterness. As I considered what would cause Esau to do such a thing, what is, in fact, this phrase, the root of bitterness, is repeated a few times in the scriptures. Next slide. The root of bitterness, I thought back one chapter to Genesis chapter 25, verse 28, which says, Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And, you know, I think I preached on that a few weeks back, and it struck me, and I thought, hmm, this is probably not a good thing. And in my study, I just wondered, is this part of the root of the bitterness? The imperfection of the parents, Isaac and Rebecca, they love the Lord, they follow God, but they have something in common with us. They were humans this side of heaven, and therefore imperfect. Not only in their parenting, but in every aspect of life we fall short and here I think we see an example of them falling short as we see the father favoring the older son and the mother favoring the younger and I thought you know being a parent is such a high calling such a difficult and rewarding path to walk on this earth and the biblical standard is very high for us parents and unfortunately, the worldly example that we see around us is often very low and one that if we were to emulate, we would not probably be pleasing to God. As I thought about a poor earthly example of parents, I was reminded of Jeremiah chapter 32. In verse 35, we read this tragic instance. They built the high places of Baal in the valley of the son of Hinnom to offer up their sons and daughters to Molech. Though I did not command them, nor did it enter into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. You know, today, Sunday, this very day, is the 49th anniversary of the liberal, unconstitutional, unbiblical, decision of Roe v. Wade. And thankfully, in the past few weeks, the Supreme Court of the United States has heard the Dobbs case and the decision will be delivered this term. And we pray that uh, it would be overturned, that we would see a return to biblical principles through the rejection of that precedent. And so in Jeremiah's time and even in our time, we find the example of men asking the woman to get an abortion, to kill the baby. We find the woman making a decision to go through with that act. And we read in Jeremiah, they're taking their children and they're literally killing them in honor of a false god. And you know, false gods are, are, are Satan's fallen angels, demons, uh, posing as a deity, appearing as angels of light. And so we have people now and in the past, making terrible decisions as parents with their children. And so you think back on some of the imperfections of your parenthood and some of the decisions you've made. Well, praise God, you haven't sacrificed your children. Or you may think back 
and see a time where you did make an awful decision. The tender side of the gospel is there's forgiveness in Christ, complete, 100%. But our tendency outside of Christ is to act selfishly. And, and perhaps it's selfish that Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. Really? That's the best you could come up with on why you love your oldest son? Seems very shallow to me. I'm reminded of Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Love does not insist on its own way. Being a parent is perhaps the most unselfish thing God ever calls anyone to do. Sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice, many times without thanks. Parents cannot play favorites with their children, I don't think. And perhaps the seeds of bitterness were planted in young Esau as he saw it lived out in his own family from the imperfection, the imperfect love of his parents. So we are to be watchful. We are to be diligent to apply all the instructions that God gives us if we want to live peaceable lives instead of lives filled, as we read in verse 35, with bitterness. You know, Proverbs 22, 6 tells us parents that we should train up a child in the way he should go. And then children, Colossians 3.20, God says, Obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Notice he, he didn't say, because they are right all the time. <laughs> obey your parents because they're right all the time. No, because they're imperfect humans. You obey your parents because this pleases the Lord. Those are the rules, but we know there are exceptions to that. And we know that when we get outside of God's commands, there are consequences when people do not follow God's ways. So as an imperfect parent, I would like to personally apply the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to my imperfect parenting even now. And if you can look back on any mistake, how small or how great, up into and including the dreaded case of abortion. And I will read to you the gospel news of 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and all unrighteousness includes all unrighteousness so if you're under the sound of my voice today imperfect parent you can be forgiven in Christ do not let any mistake any sin any error any imperfection of your past hold you back from what God has for you and what God calls you to the blood of Jesus Christ washes white as snow. So receive that good news of the gospel if you're an imperfect parent. Now let's focus on the response. As parents, we do the best we can. And, and it doesn't have to be a parent relationship. It can be a family relationship. It can be a co-worker relationship. It can be a schoolmate relationship. It can be any relationship as we try to influence people towards righteousness and godliness. We're told in Proverbs 21, 16, that one who wanders from the way of good sense will rest in the assembly of the dead. Now let's look at this child's wandering from the way of his parents. The way that Isaac and Rebekah set forth was in general a godly example. Esau has clearly wandered from that path. So point number two is the reaction of bitterness. The reaction of bitterness in the heart of Esau was that he violates God's commands and the commands of his parents. He does not obey them. He knows how important it is for his family to be marrying the right people according to God's dictates. And he chooses to marry not one but two Hittite women. Remember, this is not Esau's first offense. Back in Genesis 25, 34, we saw that he despised his birthright. He was so self-focused, so much self-love that he thought, I'm so hungry, what use is the birthright to me? Make me a meal, Jacob, and I'll give you my birthright. Happy to do it. He didn't desire God's blessing. He desired to fill his own belly. And here in today's text, he doesn't concern himself with God's curse. 
He is in open rebellion. I am going to marry not one, but two of the daughters of the enemies of God Almighty without any fear of God's wrath coming upon him. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 26 through 28 says this. See, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I commanded you today, and the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way that I have commanded you today to go after other gods that you have not known. How does this happen? How can we guard against this? in our own lives, in the lives of those that we love and cherish. Proverbs 19, 27 says, Cease to hear instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. Oh, how important it is, the influences we allow to come into our lives, whether it's YouTube or Netflix or TV or radio, all those inputs coming into your life, who you hang out with, who your friends, acquaintances, the ideas they put into two of your ears telling you what is right versus what God has said and what the people of God encourage you towards holy living. So I ask you, I ask myself, do we have bitter Esau's with their bitter wives in our lives today? Do you have people in your life making your life bitter? They are at adversity with you. They are doing everything they can to make your life hard, difficult, trouble-filled. I see a lot of heads nodding, and that makes sense to me. Why? Because I read Paul's words to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 1-5, to where he says, For people will be lovers of self. Lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy. Paul tells the Romans in chapter 1, verse 32, 30 to 32, they're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Esau knew growing up with grandfather Abraham and dad Isaac and mom Rebecca the truth about the one living God. But he was disobedient to his parents. He was foolish. He was heartless. He was ruthless. He wanted to make their lives bitter in return for their love for him. Deuteronomy, we receive a warning. Chapter 29, verses 18 to 20. Beware, lest there be among you a man or a woman or a clan or a tribe whose heart is turning away today from the Lord our God, to go and serve the gods of those nations. Beware lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. One who, when he hears the words of this sworn covenant, blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall be safe though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. This will lead to the sweeping away of moist and dry alike. Just a fascinating explanation. First of all, a warning to us to beware because this root ends up producing fruit of bitterness. And it doesn't just affect the dry, the bitter, it affects the moist as well. We are all influenced. And so it says, beware of these people who bless themselves and are confident walking in the stubbornness of their heart. Esau was stubbornly rebelling against God Almighty, attempting to make the lives of his parents miserable. Well, how are we to beware? 
What are some practical steps we can take if, if bitterness is bad and rebellion against God is bad and we see people like this in our lives? How are we to beware? How are we to combat this? Well, one thing we can do, the scriptures tell us in Matthew 18, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Confront. Talk about. Plead for reconciliation with. Pray for redemption by God Almighty. If he doesn't listen to you, take others with you. If he doesn't listen to them, take it to the church. In verse 17, if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. In other words, a sinner in need of evangelizing. So you take the gospel to roots of bitterness. You take the gospel to the Esau's in your life because the gospel through the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God Almighty is the only one that can make bitterness sweetness. It's not me. I, I'm not going to be able to convince them to be nice to me, to be nice to the rest of the family, to love others first. That's God's work. But He's given us the privilege to be the instrument to take the truths that we're studying from His Word and to present them. We have this treasure in jars of clay. Yes, we're broken and perfect. Don't know the right words to say at the right time. But we do it faithfully, knowing that God is going to use His Word to accomplish His purposes. But Rebecca, and I think moms are especially susceptible because of the investment they give in their children and the special place in their hearts that the children occupy. A chapter later in, in 27, Genesis, verse 46, Rebecca said to Isaac, I loathe my life because of the Hittite women. Whew. What a loaded statement. The impact these two daughter-in-laws are having on this godly woman. To loathe is to abhor, detest, disgust. She hates her life because of these ungodly daughter-in-laws. She says, if Jacob marries one of the Hittite women like these, one of the women of the land, what good will my life be to me? I see in that suicidal ideations. I see a woman at the end of her rope saying, I might as well be dead. If my second son marries a woman who's after the false gods like my first son did, I, I might as well just be dead. My life is over. Making life bitter for his parents, Esau and his wives. This is real. This is humanity. People get to this place in life because of the relationships that they have. So can this happen to you, Christian parent? <laughs> yes. I mean, why would it not happen to you? It happened to the patriarch Isaac. Abraham, Isaac. And it's, happened, it's been happening from the very beginning. Why would I think, expectation management that my life would be any easier than it was for the patriarchs. Lost people are slaves to sin. Sin, as we talked about in Sunday school this morning, leads to destruction. Some of the casualties are people and relationships. Very real, yes, it can happen to us. Bitterness is all around us and will try to rob us of our, of our joy if we allow it to. Is our attitude dependent upon the people around us? People in our family? Do we allow them to influence our lives to the extent that we end up where poor Rebecca did, loathing her very own life because of the difficult relationship she had in her family? Or are we causing other people to loathe their lives because we have bitterness? And we are injecting or adding to the bitterness and the conflict in the relationship. When we are bitter, it affects others as well. This, of course, is not what God has called us to. I'll turn to Philippians chapter 2. You could, you could go to <laughs> so many books and chapters. 
I just picked this one, Philippians 2, as a reminder of some of the things we should be doing. Philippians 2, verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Huh. You, you remember that uh, Deuteronomy text? I shall be safe though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. The tendency of the lost person, and even sometimes we as believers can, can be very selfish and just focus on ourselves. What's good for me? What kind of music do I like? That's the kind of music I'll demand that the church does on Sunday. What kind of colored carpet do I like? That's what I'll demand we have. We're all susceptible to that, but we're called, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. I will be working on that for the rest of my life. Let each of you look not only to his own interest. Boy, we can do that, can't we? You all have the perfect idea of who your sons and daughters should marry, the spouses they should have. That's your interest. He says, don't just look to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Now here we're stepping it up a notch in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So now God's calling you to have the same mind, mindset, that your Lord Jesus Christ has, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped or to hold on to or to retain or to keep. But he emptied himself. How did he do that? He left heaven, the incarnation. He became a man like you and me. That's how subservient he was. By taking on the form of a servant. He's God, yet he became a servant. He wants us to be servants. Being born in the likeness of men, he knows what it's like to walk in your shoes. He knows what it's like to have relationships that are bitter because people are slaves to sin. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. You know, it's, it's a very humbling act for you to obey all the things that God has commanded you to do. You want to serve yourself. You want to be like God. You want people to worship you. You want everything to go your way. But God says, I'm calling you to pour out your life, to empty your life as a servant to me for my purposes, not for your purposes. And that's what Jesus did to the point of death, verse 8, even death on a cross. Am I willing to die <laughs> for God's sake? To be the brunt of every joke. To be the receiver of every bad relationship. Will I still trust that God is sovereign over us? That he is orchestrating all things? Even the marriage relationship of my children. Proverbs 19.14 says, House and wealth are inherited from fathers. You know, you can, you can give your kids some new car, college education, maybe buy them a house and leave them a nice inheritance. That's normal humanity. But a prudent wife is from the Lord. Really? That's where those girls come from. That's where those guys come from. From the Lord. Okay. So, I think we can safely say Esau's wives were not from the Lord. They weren't prudent. And so we should pray to the God that provides prudent spouses that he would bring godly spouses to our children and grandchildren. Because if we end up with a bitter root in our family, it will have an effect. It will have a reaction. Now what's the remedy the remedy for bitterness, point three, and this is my last point, is the sweetness of the Savior. That's the remedy for all bitterness. Bitter or sweet was the question today. Dark chocolate or milk chocolate? To me, it's that obvious. Why would you choose anything other than milk chocolate? And so the gospel is to me and to you. Why would you not follow Christ? He is so sweet. He frees you from all the bitterness in this life and set your eyes on a future home where there'll be no more sorrow and no more tears. But as we read in Romans 1, 
30 to 32, people are not like that. They're not like that at, at all. And so they and we need the gospel personally. And Jesus graciously offers sweetness to us. One example, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. Are you working and toiling? Is the sweat coming off of your brow? Are you heavy laden? Are the burdens of this life, these bitter relationships, the job circumstances, the difficulty of providing for the financial needs that your family has, are they just weighing you down and crushing you? And, and you want to make good decisions, but every decision you make is a bad decision because the proverb says there's a way that seems right unto the man, but it, in the end it leads to death. Jesus says, I will give you rest for eternity. If you will stop worshiping yourself and repent of your sins and believe in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the Savior of the world, He will give you eternal rest. He will put you at peace with Him, as it says in Luke chapter 2. And then He will give you the peace of God, as it says in Philippians chapter 4, that will guard your heart and mind, that would help you with the bitter relationships you have on this earth. There is a personal call to salvation in Christ. In order to experience anything sweet in this life, you must have Christ and have Him personally. And then as a follower of Christ, we need to be freed from the chains of bitterness. We're not exempt from bitter relationships, just like the patriarch Isaac and his wife Rebecca. They weren't exempt from the difficulties of this life. And daughter-in-laws that worship false god that led their older son into greater rebellion. We need to be freed from the chains of bitterness. Jesus says in John chapter 8, Verses 31 and 32. To the Jews who had believed in him, he said, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you'll know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Yeah. We can become enslaved to bitterness. And, and we can want to return evil for evil. But it's a downward spiral. And it's the course of this world. And it's not profitable and it's not fruitful. And so even we as Christians need to be set free from our tendencies to remaining sin. And it's the truth that sets us free. So as you interpret the circumstances of life through the truth of the scriptures, then you can be freed from bitterness. When you look and you find this person in your extended family and you realize, well, God's orchestrating marriages. God's working all things together for my good. This is part of him being glorified and me being sanctified. God is on his throne and he's in charge. And so there is hope. And maybe, just maybe, God has brought this bitter spouse into our extended family so that you, child of the king, with this treasure in your broken, frail jar of clay, can befriend them and can love them and can present the gospel to them. And God may miraculously transform them to be a prudent wife who follows after the Lord. Nothing is too difficult for him. And so you, Christian, have the hope of the gospel. And you interpret every circumstance in your life as, this is not bad. Yeah, it's difficult, it's perplexing, it's hard, it's difficult, but it's not bad. Why? Because God told me through Paul in the letter to the Romans that he's working all Amen. things together for my good to those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. So by biblical definition, whatever your circumstance is, it's good. I agree with you, it's hard. I pray God relieves you from it today. But know this, he's got a purpose. 
Your suffering is not in vain. It's for his glory and your good. So be free from that bitterness. Don't succumb to the ways of the world. Lift your eyes up to the heavens from whence your help comes from. Know that your God is a redeeming God, a rescuing God, a refreshing God, a God who has the solution and the remedy to bitterness. It's the sweetness of Christ. And be that sweet aroma to Christ, to everyone he would bring into your life. And that's the final application. We are to free others from bitterness. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 to 16. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. What is grace? Unmerited favor, the giving of something that's not deserved. And what is it talking about? The grace of God, the gospel of God, the salvation of Christ that you have. Christian and you're to be propagating it and sending it out and offering it to all who would hear and listen see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God that no root of bitterness there's that phrase no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it many become defiled that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal So all the way from the beginning to all the way near the end in Hebrews, we're talking about Esau. We're talking about his sexual immorality, marrying multiple wives of false god Hittites. We're talking about his unholiness, his lack of adherence to God's principles that his godly parents laid out for him. And we're warned, don't do that. Don't be like that. Don't let those around you succumb to that. And how do we do that? By the proclamation of the truth. Because the truth is what sets people free. And you have the truth, Christian. You have it right here. And I will do better the more I read this, the more I memorize this, the more I study this, the more I talk about this, the more God will end up using us to spread this. And it doesn't return void. You know those investments you're working on for retirement? Past performance is no guarantee of future returns. But any investment you're putting into God's word that lasts forever, it always accomplishes the task that he sends it out to do. Your time here this morning, singing God's word, praying God's word, receiving the preaching of God's word, it is an investment for eternity. May God be gracious for us to go out of here and apply God's word to experience the sweetness of the Savior and to share that sweetness with all those bitter chocolate nibs around us for His glory. Father, You're so good to us in Christ, and we rejoice this morning in the sweetness of the Savior. As we see examples of bitterness in the past, we don't skip over the reality that many, even in this room, suffer bitter lives for one reason or another, one relationship or another. But God, the hope of the gospel is you can give us joy in the midst of difficulties. And we find this hope through the promises of your word. I pray that those that were read aloud this morning would seek deeply into the heart of every saint, that you would encourage them in the most holy faith for what you have for them going from this place. And for the sinner who is outside of Christ, I pray that you would use the truth of the proclamation of the gospel to draw them to yourself, that you would save them to the praise of your glorious grace, that no one would miss out on the grace of God, the gospel of the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Well, uh, I'm not going to sing a song for you. I'm just going to dismiss you. I will remind you, if you're a winter resident and you want to stay and talk to me for two minutes, I'd appreciate that conversation up front here. If you're interested in the missionary work that the Runk family is doing in Haiti, I'm going to ask them to stand out on the porch. If you'd like to engage with them, you can do so, and they'll stay as long as you want to. May God bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you, and may you bring him glory this week as you live in the sweetness of the Savior. You are dismissed.